welcome to the Dowscape Arts Podcast. This is part one of a two-part podcast titled The Character of Zen Calligraphy, recorded at calligraphy master Paul Wang's studio in Beijing, China. Paul teaches his meditative insight calligraphy method to Chinese and foreigners alike on a weekly basis, as well as Tai Chi and other traditional Chinese arts. This episode explores Paul's background in traditional Chinese calligraphy meditation, his own method of insight calligraphy, the qualities of abstract Zen Chinese calligraphy pieces, and the heights achieved by ancient Chinese calligraphy masters. So thank you, Paul, for making the time to record this podcast today. First of all, perhaps you can introduce a bit of your background with regards to calligraphy and Zen arts. And I think you said before you went to a calligraphy school when you were younger? Yeah. In primary school. Yeah, my parents sent me to a training school held by some um, old calligraphers. They're very kind. I start to learn some basic skill and knowledge about Chinese calligraphy since then. At that time, did they teach it as an art form that you could achieve something very special with, in a very maybe spiritual way, maybe attain enlightenment even? Not really. Basically on the skills of write, how to write a good-looking character, strokes, and different styles. And some teachers are full of knowledge and uh, well-educated, as I remembered, one of the old teacher, old master. It's like, it looks like a scholar. Yeah. And did they make any reference to traditional philosophy, like Zen Buddhism philosophy? Not really. Mainly, I think, is related with uh, Confucianism more, more than Buddhism. And so you got into the spiritual side of practicing arts a bit later then, in your teenage years, or a bit later than that, perhaps? Since the very beginning, uh, before I start to learn calligraphy, maybe most of children will be asked, what will be, what will it be? become, which kind of person, I would say calligrapher, but not really know what is calligrapher, that's good looking characters and they can read many on the paper and uh, framed, you know. And so your idea of the calligrapher at that time was just someone who writes very clean calligraphy? Yeah. And someone would pay you to do that, and people would appreciate your calligraphy in a kind of artistic way, or...? Not really like that. Uh, I think it's the impression from some calligraphers. It looks nice. Their attitude, their quality, you know, looks nice. Mm -hmm. And when they're writing it, it's very cool. <laughs> oh, it is so nice to become such kind of person. Can write beautiful characters and feel good with yourself. Mm. Something like that. A kind of traditional Chinese scholar character. Right. Yeah. I think at that time, many calligraphers has that attitude and quality mm. because they are well educated by traditional Chinese culture. Mm. And that's very important for me to have more interest in later, when I grown up, Confucianism, Taoism, you know, mm -hmm. and then Buddhism, I think that's very important. Before you discovered Buddhism, did you have some aspirations to write calligraphy in a Taoist way? Yeah, there's, there's a little. To write like water, you know, mm. very, very fluid smooth, and you can manage brush very well, like birds, you know, or fish, mm. 
swim in the water is more like Dyson. And when you were thinking of it in that way of attempting to follow a kind of fish or bird movement, was that a very deep spiritual idea or was that more of a shallow cultural idea? Yeah, that time is not so deep. Just from from such kind of feeling. Smooth. You can manage yourself. Your hands brush well. It's kind of expectation. So we link with many other skills. Nature. And so after that, you discovered Buddhism, and did that change your ideas about calligraphy? Did you develop a new perspective or method? So I regard calligraphy as a hobby, I think, for a long time, since primary school until high school. I really regard it as a profession anymore, especially when I grow up. And since I start to uh, study more about Confucianism and Taoism, I am more interesting. I am more interesting in calligraphy. Because it was said calligraphy is, is a very important part of the scholar. But it seems not so clear exactly why. I think when we read some of these books that say calligraphy is very, very important, the original reason why it was made so important isn't so clear. Because in the beginning, calligraphy is not regarded as art. It's just a tool. Mm. And gradually it's become uh, art and uh, calligraphy. And uh, it's also... For all the scholars, it's common to, to write well, it's, it's natural, it's part of your quality. So it was just a necessary skill so that you can write documents and... Yeah, letters, mm -hmm. yeah, every day, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing when they were writing those letters, they weren't thinking of it really in an artistic way? They weren't really intending to express themselves in a deeper, more spiritual way? When they are doing it, they don't think too much about artistic. Mm. And there is artistic. Mm. It doesn't naturally they think what they are going to write. Mm. But because they are so skillful, they don't have to think about artistic. They already express them very naturally. This this high level. So maybe the true art behind it was the way they were living their life, reading classical books from Taoism and Confucianism. Yeah, I think there's a, such kind of tradition for Chinese mm. to learn from the former and its heritage from all from, from the Asian people. Yeah, that's tradition. And so you've developed your own kind of method of calligraphy, which you call insight calligraphy. How long ago did that happen? And was there like a special moment when you suddenly had some insight or made some connection? when you thought, oh, perhaps this is how to access the deeper side of calligraphy? I think since I start to study uh, Vipassana, so it can be translated into insight meditation. Mm -hmm. And gradually when I'm writing, unconsciously, to, to use the Vipassana way to, to write, for uh, I think at least one or two years. I think it's, it's so nice, so good feeling. And at the same time I, I taught calligraphy. And gradually I naturally combined them. Right. Originally it's not called inside calligraphy. I just added into it. Mm. Until I think five years later, since I start to start study person I started to set up an insight. Mm. It become mature, clear. 
And so there are some aspects of the way you teach calligraphy that are very different from other traditional Chinese calligraphy teachers. And what would you say is the key aspect of your approach that's different from other teachers? There are three aspects. One is you must understand yourself when you're writing. If you want to write a good calligraphy, good writing, you try to understand yourself as much as you can. Because you're using your whole life to write. Your body, your breathing, your mind, you know, the hand is just part of it and extend to the brush. So that's insight, mm-hmm. right? Understand yourself. Mm-hmm. Then you must um, understand the, the calligrapher, the ancient, because you learn from them. You have to observe mm-hmm. from their strokes, from their character to perceive into their mind, their state of mind, and even state of body. Ah, so so beautiful stroke, in which state of, what kind of state of uh, body, relaxation, flexible, uh, even related with, with chi, you know, how to use them, and together with mind. I think different people might have different ideas of what a beautiful stroke might look like. And so when you say beautiful stroke, what kinds of qualities does such a stroke have? From the, from the view of inside, inside calligraphy, a beautiful stroke means from that stroke, you can feel the peace or the energy, you know, the, the active energy of that person. And this kind of energy also linked with nature, the energy of nature. That's beautiful. So it's almost as if the stroke is alive yeah. and there is some kind of life force inside of it. Right. In the beginning, I didn't pay too much attention to students for uh, Vipassana itself because most of students uh, didn't do meditation. Yeah. So if you talk too much, it will feel strange. So I mainly focus on inside of his body, breathing and mind, and inside on the, the Asian masters' works, the art, art, nature, and gradually one day can immerse you know, into this tool. Mm-hmm. They will feel something yes. of vipassana. Yeah. Because they are using the way of vipassana to do it. Sure. Then you keep them. It's very easy. Right. I'm guessing that if they are interested in Buddhism, then they'll feel that sense um, in a Buddhist way. But if they're interested in Taoism or maybe Christianity, then perhaps they'll feel some sense of spiritual connection in a slightly different way, maybe? Yeah, maybe. But I I prefer them to have more sense or interest on themselves, mm. on their own body and mind. Mm. There's no religion. Mm. Yeah. No religion. It's just about it is what it is. So some of these calligraphy pieces are quite abstract, and even Chinese people find it quite difficult to understand why they've been made or what they mean. And yet, it seems they can appreciate them, and it seems also Western people can appreciate them to some degree. And would you say this appreciation is probably due to the liveliness in the strokes, like you said already? Do you think it's something like that? More than that. Because... uh we can think like this, the calligraphy or the, the good calligraphy is kind of uh, a trans, translator. You know? So we use, as a calligraphy, we use strokes to translate, translate uh, the state of nature into strokes to let you see this is nature. 
But if you can't understand the language of strokes, you can't directly understand what I'm expressing. It's a media. Mm. And also these strokes represent myself. If you can't understand our, a background about uh, the quality of a well-educated scholar, for example, mm. what kind of virtues he should have, if you don't know, it's not easy to understand. Yeah, and I think these works of abstract Chinese calligraphy are quite appealing to people in the West. And I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe different people see something different inside them. And they feel drawn to them. And maybe it's the mysterious feeling or the organic flowing shapes that these strokes create. But I can't help but feel that they can get something more than that from these pieces. There's something very attractive about them that I don't think is just a matter of it being exotic or foreign. But, but uh, such kind of thing is, uh, is, is, is too random, I think. Because different people have different feelings. Mm. And different people have different feelings in different time. So in this way, there's almost no standard anymore. But that's not calligraphy. Mm. Calligraphy, there is standard. There's rules, mm -hmm. and these standard and rules represent the true nature, the true nature. If you can't understand the true nature well, you can't appreciate that. You may have wrong feeling. Well, let's say a piece of abstract Chinese calligraphy was written by the Buddha, and people are drawn to the Buddha because of his aura, you know, this feeling of compassion and kindness. Maybe his work of calligraphy would also have that quality transferred into it, and people would be drawn to that, and they wouldn't be exactly sure why they're drawn to it. Yeah, the Buddha is, is very special. You know, maybe we can use example of maybe um, mm, a senior monk, maybe. Okay. Not really enlightened, right. but a senior monk, mm -hmm. well educated, has good virtue. And, but this kind of person, his mind level is, is higher than normal person. But even though, if he can't manage brush well, he didn't learn about calligraphy's forms well, it's hard for him to express the beautiful, you know, forms with nature and to express his own virtue. But for an enlightened person is another story, I think. Really enlightened person, they can break through this layer. Mm -hmm. They can right away grasp the core of you know nature and mm -hmm. because their virtue is their enlightenment. I think it's possible. But even for a senior monk, it's not so easy. If they didn't practice. Right. Because we used to have this discourse about how to appreciate, distinguish a work. And many artists uh, start to think there's no standard anymore. Just maybe they are influenced by some Western uh, art just just follow their feeling, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's a way. We have to. It's a way. But it's not the the way of traditional calligraphy. Traditional calligraphy has a range. Really have a range, and this range can confirm you can reach the good nature. Of, of, of big nature and, mm -hmm. and the personal nature, you know. There is a range. Rules. You must master that rules. Skill. This is an interesting idea that you find in a lot of meditative arts, uh, this idea of letting go. 
And I remember one time when I was writing a final piece, or preparing to write a final piece, and I was feeling a bit anxious about achieving the level that I wanted to achieve with it. And I remember you said to me, let it go, which was a very kind of Zen statement. And it helped a lot, of course. But with this idea of letting go, I think some people feel of it, uh, fearful of it in a way, because it brings about some idea of just being um, left floating. And so people don't really have a confidence about letting go because they're not sure what they're letting go into. They want to you know, let go of one thing and then receive another. For example, a Christian might want to let go of this world of sin and find themselves in God's kingdom, something like that. When writing calligraphy and we let go, what should we let go into? So let go means at first to put down your expectation. At first, let go, let, let your expectation go. No expectation. Just do it. But just do it how? <laughs> right? It's another question. How? Yeah. Along with the sense of brush, okay? sincerely, along with the brush, oh, elastic, soft, along with your sense of body, soft or not, relaxed or not, along with sense of your breathing, stuck or not, you know, sense of your mind, tense or not, along with this, and tune. Mm. Just do it. Mm. They become nervous, it's okay. Disappear, right? When you allow it to, to appear and look, it will disappear. That means let go. Mm. Right. So I think what people are afraid of is just letting go and then just being left there floating in space. But from what you've just said, it sounds like you're saying let go into the physicality of the present moment, into the physical sense of the present moment through the body. Physical sense, mental sense together. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a realm. Conditions. Let go with these conditions. Play with these conditions. Then you, you more, have more relaxation. So it's not really let go of any idea. It's let go of all ideas. Yeah. And just sense what's here. Yeah. To be here now, what is happening? Happening. It's happening with your body, mind, breathing. At the same time, brush. I think some people who like to do, for example, watercolor painting or Western calligraphy might say that that's what they do when they are practicing watercolor or calligraphy. What's the extra thing that a good Chinese calligraphy brush and ink and paper have that um, opens up some extra dimension or, or potential that, for example, watercolor or Western calligraphy can't access. For ink painting, the, the outstanding painter, ink painting painter, ancient one or modern one, they have a very good sense of brush. Brush, mm. as the same as calligraphy. Could it be any brush? For example, I think the uh, Japanese Soto Zen priest Shunrai Suzuki took a piece of a plant and use that to write some calligraphy one time. You can do that. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, but it needs the, it needs high level mental state. Not everybody can do that. It's like uh, so the sense of brush isn't just about traditional Chinese calligraphy brushes. It could be about any other tool that you're using to write calligraphy with. Chinese brush. As in different brush to, to paint different things, you know, trees, flower, mountain. They may use different brush. Mm. Different 
quantity of water or ink. They have good understanding of water and ink, the property between them. And also, one they very skillful with all of this brush, ink, and water and paper. Also, they will naturally link with their uh, understanding about nature. That they observe nature a lot. They observe what they are going to paint a lot, a lot. So that's a kind of meditation yeah. mindset, right? Right. right. Mm. Yeah. Then they naturally combine together to, and the brush, express mm. what they want to express: the mountain or flower or more yeah. person. And I think you've said before that they want to express this lively intention uh, inside something like a mountain or a person or a flower, and this is the same lively intention that a traditional Chinese calligrapher intends to put inside his strokes. Yeah, a similar between calligraphy and painting. They want to express the understanding. About nature, about virtue,、uh, they want to express themselves,、uh, or combine and you know, mixed with one work. And so, how was it possible for the virtue of an ancient Chinese calligrapher, for example, Wang Shijie, to come out through his body and be expressed in his works of calligraphy? A different. Person has different virtue, different quality of virtue. Some calligrapher、uh, prefer more on Confucianism, some more on Taoism, some Taoism or Buddhism, and some maybe combined. I think、so、Wang Shijie is combined three of them. For Taoism. Maybe help him to understand nature. I think he must has very deep understanding about nature, about his body. You know, then he use his body with the understanding of nature to, to write. It's hard to surpass、mm. later. Yeah, you know,、right. it, it's so wonderful. Is it difficult to surpass because the human body and mind have their limits? And so, you know, you reach a certain point, and you just can't really go any further. Not human body has, has an individual has 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 himself. You know, other people hard to surpass him to understanding,、mm -hmm. not so high level understanding or deep understanding about one's body. And nature together, it's very hard.、Mm. But him, he can,、mm. and、uh, also he he has good understanding about Asian people,、mm. their works.、Mm. So all of this together, hard to surpass, almost impossible. And also the time, history,、mm. historic time, impossible. So it's just some meeting of conditions that happen to arise at that point, right? So he becomes the best, the first, first man, right?、Okay. Not depends on only himself. This is the end of podcast three, part one: the character of Zen calligraphy with Paul Wang. Which is continued in part two of this series.